Last week I covered um, science and uh, scenarios of climate change, science of climate change and scenarios of emissions. Um, and today we're going to look at uh, what to do about these emissions, how to reduce them. Um, I'm probably not going to talk about geoengineering. Um, <clears throat> this is where we are in the schedule. We're about a, an hour ahead of the schedule, which is good because I will um, need at least an extra hour <laughs> to talk about instruments. Um, so I'm going to talk about emission reduction options before the break, and then we're going to talk uh, about the costs of emission reduction, uh, the first half of that uh, after the break. So that is uh, the plan for today. So last week I talked about the scenarios of the CHI identity, and today we're going to talk about uh, options for greenhouse gas emission reduction, and the starting point of that is also the CHI identity. So the CHI identity, recall, is has that emissions, and I keep changing the notation, I realize that emissions equal the number of people times per capita income times uh, the energy intensity of the economy times the carbon intensity of the um, energy uh, sector. And that is an identity, right? This is true because P cancels against P, Y against Y, X against X. So it's an identity, it's true, you can't argue with it. Now if this is true, then what is also true is if you take the log on both sides of the equation, because the log of something is equal to the log of the same thing, right? Um, and then that multiplication, of course, turns into an addition. And then if you take the first partial derivative to time, uh, then it's still true. Because if something changes over time, that is equal to that same thing changes over, changing over time, right? It's just we apply uh, identical operations to uh, something identical. Now this is a strange expression. Right? This is not something that you're used to looking at. But recall that the first partial derivative of the log, natural log of E to T is according to the chain rule, uh, chain rule, sorry. Uh, the first partial derivative of log E uh, is one over E times DE DT, right? And this thing here is simply the change in emissions. Can be noted by E dot. Uh, and this is just emissions. Um, so d log e d t is simply the proportional growth rate of emissions. Right? So what this other uh, manifestation of the chi identity tells you is that the growth rate of emissions is equal to the growth rate of the population plus the growth rate of per capita income, plus the growth rate of the energy intensity, plus the growth rate of the carbon intensity. And that immediately tells you that you have four basic options to reduce emissions. Reducing emissions means that this thing, the growth rate of emissions, becomes negative, right? That is the definition of reducing emissions. And you can do that in four basic ways. You can cut the number of people. You can cut uh, their income. You can improve energy efficiency or reduce the energy intensity. And you can switch fuels uh, so that the, you emit less CO2 per unit of energy, right? Those are your four basic options, Shamira. Uh, that's just I stands for intensity. Oh. Sorry. I changed notation twice, right? <laughs> Sorry about that. I'll fix these. Um, these symbols are different than they were last week and are different than in the book. Um, Sorry about that. Um, oh, no, 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 no. Here I have X over Y, right? So here I should have X over Y and I replaced it by XI. I should not have done that, right? I'll fix it. Thanks. It's not, this is not the growth rate of 
energy use is the growth rate of energy intensity. Good point. Um, so, those are your four basic options to reduce emissions, right? Uh, and they're listed here. Um, the first one, uh, cut the number of people, is perhaps not something you want to do, not something you want to say as a politician in a democratic uh, country, messing with other people's decisions about fertility is not something that you can stand on uh, and hope to be re-elected, as the, um, re the Republicans in the US are currently finding out, right? So this is not really an option. Um, some countries have put this forward. Um, China has for a long time in the international climate negotiations claimed that its one-child policy is its major contribution to international climate policy. That is complete hogwash. The one-child policy was introduced in 1980 for reasons that are completely unrelated to their concern about climate change. But they've nevertheless put forward uh, this claim. Um, and of course, now that China is concerned about climate change, they have abolished the one-child policy and replaced it first with a two-child policy and nowadays with a three-child policy. Not very effective. Um, but, I mean, Liz Truss is completely nuts, right? But she is not nuts enough to say, you guys should have babies now, right? That is so beyond the pale, uh, even for uh, the current uh, Tories, right? The second option that you have is cutting economic growth. And no country in the world, no politician in the world, says that that is what they want to do, that they want to make people poorer. Of course, some countries are doing this, right? And again, uh, the current government uh, in the UK is a good example of this. But that is not what is in their manifesto, right? It is a very effective policy. Um, this is uh, what happened to uh, the Soviet Union. Um, so uh, steady growth in uh, blue in the economy uh, and in red uh, in emissions until the Berlin Wall fell, the Soviet Union came apart, the economy uh, collapsed, right? And what you see is that the economy went down and emissions went down with it, right? This is a very effective way of reducing your emissions. It is not something that you want to get re-elected on. There is, of course, the degrowth movement that say that this is what we should be doing, but this is mostly uh, middle class and upper class academic talking to themselves, saying that this is a good idea. Guys, we should stop growing our economy for the sake of the environment is not something that you want to say. That implies <coughs> that you have only two options left, right? Uh, it's a bit worse than that. If you don't want to touch this and you want this to be positive, then the only way to get this one negative is to work really hard on these two terms, right? These have to become really, really negative to overcome population growth and economic growth, right? Um, so, those are our two basic options. And I'm gonna spend uh, some time uh, on this. So, first look at energy efficiency uh, improvements or reductions of the energy intensity. Energy intensity is just a reciprocal of energy efficiency, right? So, how do these things uh, come about? Well, energy savings come about essentially through two uh, routes. Uh, the first is technological change and the second is behavioral change. But let's look at technological change first. Now, if you look at a single product, um, say, a car or a laptop or a mobile phone, uh, then the new version is always more energy efficient 
than the previous version. Um, and the reason for that is very basic. For mobile phones, it is about battery life, right? So if you have a mobile phone that is more energy efficient than a mobile phone with the exact same characteristics, the exact same performance, but uses less energy, that means that your battery will last longer. And that most people see as a positive because uh, nothing is as bad as running out of juice on your phone, right? Um, the same is true for a fridge, say if you as a company are able to put on the market a fridge that is just as good and just as big and just as wide as the competitors uh, fridge, but uses less energy, uses less electricity, then it's cheaper to run. And that appeals to your uh, customers, right? So it is in the interest of companies to put more energy efficient uh, products on the market and it's in the interest of all the buyers to buy more energy efficient products because we have the same level of comfort but we pay less in our energy bills, right? And I don't need to remind you at this juncture in time that energy bills are important uh, to people, right? But that is not where the story ends, that's not where the story ends at all because these energy efficiency improvements can also be used for other purposes. Uh, and the best example uh, coming uh, is from uh, cars in the United uh, States. And what you see here is uh, free graphs starting in 1975 and these are changes uh, until the year 2020, it's actually fairly recent data. <coughs> And what you see is that uh, fuel economy actually improved uh, quite rapidly uh, through the 70s until 1985 or so. And then it stabilized, right? And I just told you that that is not how things work, right? I told you energy efficiency is always improving. Nah, <laughs> it just stayed the same, right? For, what is it, uh, 15, 20, 25 years? Uh, actually went down a little bit. But there's two other graphs. Uh, one is the weight of the car. And this is just the American tendency to buy ever bigger cars. And you've seen, you think you've seen big cars on the roads in England. It means you've never been to the United States, right? Where they have really, really, really big cars, right? Uh, but somehow people think it's okay to uh, drive. Um, you see is that the weight has increased um, and fuel efficiency stayed roughly constant, weight has increased. That means that the, because the weight has increased the horsepower, you put ever more powerful engines in those cars as well, right, just to pull all that weight along. And even when weight stabilized, uh, horsepower uh, kept going up, so you have ever more powerful uh, engines in the car. Um, there's actually quite a feat of engineering, right? To keep fuel efficiency roughly stable with ever heavier and ever more powerful cars. So the technological improvement did not stop, right? It's just that the better engines were not used to cut fuel use but they were used first to build bigger and heavier cars and then to build cars that accelerate ever faster right so if you compare like with like you see technological improvements in terms of reduced energy use but it may of course be that the consumer says, no, I don't want fuel savings, I want a bigger car, right? So that is an important uh, thing uh, to keep uh, in mind here. Now, by and large, uh, and that is a graph that I showed last week, uh, energy efficiency has improved. Where is it now? Uh, energy efficiency. I see my next slide, <laughs> just not, the not just the current slide. So uh, that's why I was confused. 
Uh, energy efficiency has roughly improved over the 55-year uh, period, right? Uh, there is a uh, paper by uh, the Nobel laureate Bill Nordhaus where he actually pushes this back to Babylonian times. Obviously, then we're not talking about total energy efficiency, but he just looks at the energy efficiency of lighting. And actually, if, and they have been, archaeologists have found ancient lamps and there's good descriptions of how to build a lamp. And uh, Babylonians wrote up all sorts of everything uh, in clay and that is preserved over time. Um, so we can actually rebuild Babylonian lamps and just measure how efficient they are. And actually what we see is that if you look over that 5,000 year period, the energy efficiency of lighting has steadily improved, right? So this trend that you see here over the last 55 years, it can actually push back another 5,000 years and the trend is the same, right? And the reason is yeah, energy is expensive, so we want to save on it, right? We care about the light that comes out, but we care not for the energy, the cost that goes in, right? Um, <clears throat> so that trend uh, has been steady uh, over the millennia. Um, <clears throat> the second thing uh, that you can do to uh, change uh, energy efficiency is change people's behavior. Um, if you ask an engineer, what do we do with our energy, then uh, they will tell you that a lot of energy is wasted. And engineers always say 30%. It doesn't matter what the question is, the answer is always 30%. Uh, and there's a lot of papers out there claiming that 30% of the energy that we use serves no real purpose. Um, and that may be people leaving the light on in the bathroom after they leave, right? The light is on for no reason, there's nobody there, but the light is still on, right? That is a pure waste uh, of energy. Uh, another um, popular example in the United Kingdom is people filling up their kettle with water and then take one cup of tea out so you boiled way too much water, right? Which is a pure waste of energy. And if you top it all up, it actually comes to uh, a fair amount of energy that we could save without any loss uh, of comfort, right? The problem um, here is that it's actually very difficult to change such habits. Now, most of you live in shared apartments and some of you may share an apartment with an energy Nazi who's going around after you saying that you should turn off the light and you should not burn uh, or fill up the kettle so much, right? And those people are very annoying, right? Uh, one day you will have kids and you will be the one who's going after them. Um, this actually comes at a cost uh, of social relations to change these. And it's actually very hard for governments to in any way persuade people to stop doing these silly things. Um, <clears throat> so even though the option is there, it's not costless to change it and it's actually very hard to affect this change. There's been plenty of government initiatives with ads on telly or ads on your mobile phone or People trying to convince you through TikTok that you really shouldn't be doing this, it all washes out. It just doesn't, sometimes it has an effect for a week or two, but then people move back to their old habits, right? So that is very, very difficult uh, to affect. And there is a deeper problem here, uh, and that is the principal agent uh, problem. Um, so the principal uh, is the one who pays the bills, and the agent is the one who controls the resource use. So in this setting, uh, I am the agent. It is my obligation as a lecturer to turn off the equipment after uh, the end of the lecture. I don't pay the electricity bill. That goes to the vice chancellor. And 
there's no real reason for me to do it because if I were to turn off all the lights after the lecture, yes, the vice chancellor pays less in electricity. She doesn't increase my wages, she doesn't increase my research budget. So why would I do this, right? I would say, well, it's a small effort sticking up my hand, turning off the light, but yeah, it's not really in my interest uh, to do so. Now, this is a small problem. But actually, if you go around campus, right, uh, at five in the evening, well, six in the evening when it's dark, it'll be dark sooner. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you see that there's a lot of lights on, right? And if you walk around town late at night, you see that there's a lot of lights on in empty office buildings, right? Or in empty shops. There's a lot of electricity being wasted uh, in that sense. And these things are difficult uh, to change, right? Another big uh, issue, uh, another uh, prime example of a principal agent problem is uh, rental accommodation. So you, as uh, the one who rents an apartment, you are responsible for the energy bills. That's what you pay. But in your lease it says that you are not allowed to change the physical structure of your apartment. You cannot put, double glazed, uh, put in double glazed windows or wall insulation or loft insulation or change uh, the boiler. That is all the landlord or landlady who is responsible for that. So it's in your interest to put in double glazed windows because you would save on your energy bills but it's not in the landlord's interest to do this for you because the information of the, the sort of the energy saving properties or the energy use properties of your apartment is not something that determines the rent at all. That information gets very weakly transmitted uh, in the rental market. Um, And therefore, there is no reason for them to really keep up your buildings to the highest standards, right? Now, these problems are relatively easy to identify, and economists love talking about these problems uh, because they make sort of a nice game theory and that sort of stuff. Um, but they're very difficult to solve. They're easy to solve in theory, right? I mean, what we should do at the university is that we should change all the lightning uh, and when I come into uh, the building, when I come into the room, I should uh, swipe my card and the electricity uh, starts counting towards me, right? And comes out of my research budget. That's how we should change things, right? And then when I walk out, yeah, I have a reason to uh, turn things off again because it will come out of my budget or maybe out of my salary. That is how you would change this, right? To make sure that the principal and the agent are the same people, right? Essentially. There's a major change in the way the university is run, right? And similarly, if we go back to uh, rented apartments, that would be a complete overhaul of the relationship between um, the lease um, would essentially rewrite uh, all lease contracts, right? Um, so yes, easy to identify, easy to solve in theory, very difficult to solve in practice, right? <clears throat> now the other way, the, 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 the third way in which you can save energy is to use less of it, right? To take your holiday in Blackpool rather than in Bangkok this summer. Right? That would save a lot of energy. But you guys have not been allowed to go on holiday for a very long time and it will be very hard to convince you that Bristol is just as exciting, or I said Blackpool, that Blackpool is just as exciting as Bangkok, right? Um, it is not, right? Nothing wrong with Blackpool. But, um, similarly, it is very difficult to convince people to turn down their thermostat and put on a sweater, right? This is something that appeals to a small minority, but it's not something that you convince, can convince the majority uh, of doing that. this, not in order to save the climate. So yes, there are all sorts of things that can be done here, but it is difficult to achieve some of these things, right? Um, the uh, fourth option, according to uh, the CHI identity, is to switch to 
other fuels. Um, so I talked um, last week about that not all fossil fuels are created equal, that there's much more CO2 coming out of uh, coal than uh, out of natural gas. And I showed you the picture of the US electricity system switching from coal to gas and cutting emissions uh, by quite a bit. So that is one option, switching between fossil fuels. Of course, at the moment, what we're doing in Europe is because bloody Putin, uh, there's no more gas coming out of Russia, we're cranking up our coal-fired power plants, right? That is what we're doing at the moment. So we're making the switch uh, in the wrong direction. Um, apart from uh, switching between fossil fuels, you can also just switch away from fossil fuels. Roll. Sorry, what did you just say about Europe? We're cranking up. Yeah? Yeah, that didn't catch it, sorry. What we're doing at the moment, because we're running out of gas, is we keep our power plants, coal-fired power plants. Uh, there's a couple of things. Some of them are running at much higher capacity than we had planned. Some of them are not being retired, even though they should have been retired. And what is going on in the UK is that we take a couple of these power plants that have been switched off and are turning them back on to make it through the winter. And that's happening all over Europe at the moment. And that's simply because gas is so expensive if it's there at all. Right? Okay. So we can switch away, we can switch between fossil fuels and that help if you make the right switch. Uh, but we can also switch away from fossil fuels. Um, and there's a bunch of options there. We have nuclear, we have hydro, uh, both old, tried and tested technologies, and then the newer ones, um, wind, uh, solar, uh, and biomass that are also by now um, proven technologies. If you look at this from a physical perspective, there is no issue whatsoever. The amount of sunshine we receive, if you could harvest it all, would serve the world's energy needs 10 times over. There's no physical limitation to these alternative sources. Also, if you look at nuclear and you go to the thorium cycle, there's plenty of nuclear material uh, out there. Uh, don't worry about resource scarcity at all. You also should not worry uh, about the technical feasibility of this because these are all by now proven technologies. We know how to build a nuclear power plant, obviously. We have known how to build a hydro uh, power plant for ages. Wind turbines are working well. Solar panels are working well. Uh, biomass is all working uh, perfectly fine from a technical perspective, right? So there's no resource constraints there. There's no technological constraints there. You can supply the world's energy use with these fossil-free uh, sources, carbon-free sources, uh, no uh, problem. Uh, the difficulties lie uh, elsewhere. Um, and we need to solve those difficulties uh, anyway. Um, because of this uh, particular uh, graph. Um, and this is a hard one to read, hard one to explain. What you see on the um, horizontal axis are gaseous fuels, liquid uh, fossil fuels, and then the solid uh, uh, fossil fuels. Uh, so that is easy, right? Um, then we have different colors. Um, First, it is the reserves, and the reserves are defined as that amount of gas that is in the ground. We know where it is, we know how to take it out of the ground, and we know how to take it out of the ground and sell it at a profit. That is the definition of a reserve, right? Uh, and then there's resources, and resources come in free gradation, gradations proved probable and possible. Resources are those things that 
we know are in the ground but we don't know how to get out profitably or we know are in the ground but we're not quite sure who owns it or we know are in the ground but we haven't quite developed the technology yet to get it out of the ground right um, and those are uh, the grayish uh, colors those are the resources uh, of fossil fuels then on the horizontal axis we're looking at what would happen to the atmospheric concentration of CO2 if we would burn these reserves and resources in one go. It is not advisable because that would take up so much oxygen uh, that you would run out, but it's a thought experiment, right? Um, what CO2 would we add to the atmosphere? Um, if we were to burn it all in one go. <clears throat> um, now, the reason that I put this up is because of um, what it tells you. Uh, if you look at natural gas, reserves are actually not that large, about 50 uh, parts per million. And we don't have any resources left, hardly, of conventional uh, gas. So we need a, we want to continue to burn gas. I mean, gas will run out, conventional natural gas will run out within decades. Um, so we need to find an alternative, right? The current is the shale gas, right? Uh, this is a slightly older picture, uh, but now there's some reserves of shale gas as well, not just resources. Similarly, if you look at oil, this is conventional oil. Reserves are actually not that large. Resources are a little bit larger, uh, but getting harder and harder into. Um, so also oil, conventional oil, will probably run out, not within decades, but within your lifetime. I will probably see the end of conventional gas. You will see the end of conventional oil. So we need to do something, right? Within decades, we need a complete transformation of the energy sector because we're running out of the stuff that currently our economy uh, is running on. There's major implications of this, right? Also political implications. This is Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. This is Qatar and Russia. The big geopolitical players in energy are running out of their stuff. And by the time you're 50, they will no longer be major players on the world scene because they will lose their role in the energy market, right? Um, and the question is, then what, right? So we need a major transformation in the energy supply because we're running out of the stuff that the current uh, world economy is running on. The question is, what are we going to do next, right? Uh, so there's going to be a major transformation. But this is a class about climate. Uh, so if you add up the conventional oil and gas, and that's only 80 parts per million, that's another degree, degree and a half of warming. And that's it. We can burn all the Russian and Qatari gas, and we can burn all the Saudi and Kuwaiti oil, and the world would warm by one degree. And if you're worried about warming that goes beyond the one degree, then you are worried about what will replace the Russian gas and what will replace the Saudi oil, right? Now what you also see in this graph is that there's plenty of fossil fuels to go around, right? There's the unconventional uh, oils, there's the shale gas. These coal numbers you should not believe, they're not looking very hard for coal. Uh, so <laughs> there's a lot of resources, a uh, reserve still, Resource numbers you should not believe because we haven't looked very hard for them because there's no reason to look for additional coal because we have too much coal anyway. Um, <clears throat> but we need to um, find a replacement for our conventional oil and gas regardless of the climate problem, right? 
Um, so what can we do, right? And at the moment, the market is betting very heavily on shale oil and gas, right? Um, rather than on the alternatives. Um, so what can be done here? Um, <clears throat> Nuclear and hydro, as I said, are old, tried and trusted uh, technologies. Um, the problem with both is that they're very difficult politically and socially. Uh, if you want to build a large hydro uh, power plant, you need a large reservoir and you need to evacuate a large number of people, damn it, natural reserves, damn it, uh, cultural heritage, so this is hard, a hard sell, right? You need to be an autocratic country like uh, Ethiopia or like China to actually be able to build large new hydro uh, plants. Um, what we're actually seeing in North America at the moment is that people are taking away dams on rivers rather than building new ones. Uh, similarly, nuclear, a lot of resistance still. Despite the current situation, Belgium last week turned off a nuclear power plant because of social uh, opposition. Germany is still hellbound from closing uh, its uh, nuclear fleet uh, within the next few years. All, all because people just don't like nuclear. There's a bit of an exception at the moment in the UK where um, building two new power, well, we're building one new nuclear power plant in C and we're sort of gearing up to building a second one um, without much uh, protest. Um, reasons are not quite clear to me why the English people are so laid back about nuclear compared to, uh, to other people uh, in Europe. Uh, but it's very, very difficult to expand the nuclear fleet uh, substantially. <clears throat> and it's not just that you need to build a few new nuclear power plants to make a major dent in your CO2 emissions. No, you build, need to build lots and lots and lots of them. And not just in places uh, like Somerset, where you have a roughly uh, stable and an approximately democratic uh, regime um, that has a reasonable uh, regulatory capacity. Now, if you really want to make a dent in your CO2 emissions, you need to build nuclear power plants everywhere, right? Including in such places as Pakistan, including in such places as the Central African Republic. There's two problems with that. Nuclear power plants are dangerous, so you need really qualified people, really, come in, really qualified engineers uh, to run them, and they need to be very well regulated, because if those things explode, then you have a big problem. So that is one issue, and that capacity to regulate and properly run nuclear power plants is simply not available everywhere. And the second, if you build a nuclear power plant, you also have not just a waste problem that people worry about but shouldn't, uh, but you also have a proliferation uh, problem, because if you can run a nuclear power plant, then you can also build a dirty bomb, right? Can't quite build an atomic bomb that requires a bit of extra, as uh, the Iranians are showing at the moment. Um, but you can definitely uh, build a dirty bomb. And you don't want the Taliban to get their hands on nuclear material, right? And they're not just in Afghanistan. Um, they're also all over uh, Africa at the moment. So nuclear and hydro, Difficult, right? We can sort of expect a small expansion there, but we cannot expect a large expansion, and we may not want a large expansion of nuclear uh, and hydro. Can build uh, wind turbines. Uh, these are older slides, and wind turbines used to be expensive. Um, no longer. Um, Solar uh, is another option, used to be expensive, uh, but they are no longer. And the technological progress there has been absolutely astounding. Uh, I've been teaching this stuff for uh, two decades, and I've been researching this stuff for 35 years now. It used to be bloody expensive. 
but not anymore. Uh, looking actually, this is only the last 10 years. Uh, we push this back further into the past. You just see how the costs of this is uh, photovoltaics uh, has come down, right? In the last 10 years, only from 350 to less than, well, 350 to 50. Seven folds, right? It used to be seven times as expensive only 10 years ago. Um, <coughs> similarly for wind, not quite as spectacular uh, as uh, solar, but still roughly a halving of costs uh, of onshore wind, offshore wind, uh, also costs have halved in the space of a decade, right? It is absolutely astounding uh, when you think of it, right? The reason that wind is becoming cheaper has mostly to do with process innovation. They're just becoming smarter and smarter and smarter at building wind turbines. That is the main reduction in costs. Wind turbines now are slightly better than wind turbines 10 years ago. It's mostly that the manufacturing of these things has gotten a lot, lot better. Um, it's just old technology, right? Just uh, it's an old propeller plane, essentially, is what uh, a wind turbine is. Um, photovoltaics, there is technological progress also in the product itself. It's not just the manufacturing that has gotten a lot better than it used to be. It's also that the, uh, the panels themselves are a lot better uh, than they used to be. And they're actually piggybacking on uh, rapid progress in material science. That is where a lot of the improvement uh, is coming from. And also it's the uh, material science that is driving down the costs of uh, storage of electricity in batteries. And this is only uh, six years, right? 800 down to 200, 400, uh, fourfold uh, decrease um, over a very short period. This is essentially not driven by our demand for renewable energy or storage of electricity, but it's driven by the demand for ever, uh, ever better laptops and ever better uh, phones, and nowadays also ever better cars. So you bits where it's increasing, is that when there's a lot of research going into it or something? Um, you mean uh, this, this bit here? With the yellow and blue line. Oh, this bit here. Um, I mean, uh, it is a bit of a boom and bust um, thing. Um, so uh, here there was a lot of additional capacity uh, coming online and actually they were a bit too enthusiastic in building uh, <laughs> these things. Uh, so there was a, a, an oversupply for a while that drove down the costs and then they stopped building new factories and then there was a scarcity and that drove up the price again. Uh, there's also variations in the price of some of the things that you put in. Uh, there's exchange rate movements that is also behind it. So you should not expect a straight line, right? And you should expect a, a, a few wobbles. Um, but really you should just focus on the overall trend, right? I mean, when I first taught this, I said, well, yeah, solar and power, solar and wind is four times as expensive, five times as expensive as coal-fired uh, or gas-fired power plants. <coughs> and then for a while I said it was twice as expensive, and then for a while I said oh, it's 25% more expensive. The moment solar outcompetes coal and gas, if you want to have cheap electricity, the cheapest option to make new power is by building uh, large solar plants. Uh, and in some parts of the world, and that includes the Texas Panhandle, where land is cheap and winds are strong, or the North Sea, the cheapest way of generating electricity is offshore wind in the North Sea and obviously onshore wind uh, in the Texas Panhandle, right? There's simply no competing with, oil, uh, with wind and solar in 2022, right? Um, there are problems uh, with this. Wind is visually intrusive, it damages bats, it damages uh, birds, and people are upset about that. Uh, most of you live in Brighton, you've seen 
the wind park off the coast. Does it bother you? Actually, we see the reverse now. We see now people actually expressing appreciation for the sight of wind turbines. Ten years ago, everybody hated the things, but now people actually see them as, yeah, it's a nice part of the landscape, right? So also this, uh, next year I should probably strike out this uh, as well. Uh, solar has a waste problem. Solar panels are full of dirty chemicals, heavy metals. And as long as they're on your roof, they're fine. But when you take them off, you have a waste problem. And the waste industry is now gradually gearing up to this. Yeah, well, the first solar panels are now 20 years old and people are taking them off their roof and they need to be disposed as chemical waste, right? And that uh, needs to be, um, that capacity needs to increase fairly rapidly now. <clears throat> the uh, other big problem with wind and solar is that they're only available when the wind blows and they're only available when the wind and the sun shines, so they require storage. But battery power, uh, the cost of battery and batteries is coming down very, very rapidly. So that is being solved. And we're also working on using electric vehicles as sort of storing uh, energy overnight and over day and those sort of things. Uh, demand side management uh, really kicks in here. Um, so that is gradually being solved. Uh, and the other problem with wind and solar is that the best sun is where the people aren't and the best wind is where the people aren't. So you need actually long distance uh, transport uh, of electricity, which is not a technical problem but adds to the cost. But all these problems uh, are being worked on and uh, coming down uh, fairly rapidly. <clears throat> Older slides. It used to be that I would say but wind and solar electricity is good for your laptop, it's good for your light, you can use it for heating, uh, not really. Um, you can use it for cooking, but you can't use it to drive your car, right? Is what I used to say. Also, that problem is being taken off the table. But there is an, another alternative for making liquid fuels that are very good for uh, transport. Um, and that is to use biomass. Um, the biofuels that are currently on the market are so-called first generation biofuels. And they are actually the sort of technology that the Romans would recognize. So we take oil seeds, rape seeds uh, in this country, uh, you could take uh, palm oil, uh, things like that, and essentially you press them and then you have oil, right? And uh, yeah, we, we don't do it quite as the Romans did, but a Roman engineer would recognize what we are doing with this. It's a very primitive uh, sort of technology, very basic technology. <clears throat> um, the problem uh, with this is that the stuff that we use to make biofuels, bioliquids, is stuff that we can also eat or stuff that we can feed to pigs and then we eat the pigs, right? So there's a direct competition of the current biofuels with food production. And at the moment, for instance, uh, 25, 30% of the US corn harvest is turned into bioethanol. And that drives up the price of tacos and tortillas, right? And if there's a bad harvest in the US of corn, then you see food riots in Mexico. Because it's uh, the 25% being diverted is not based on price, but it's a mandated amount. So <laughs> simply being told you have to, 25% has to go uh, into fuel. Um, so that is a problem. Now, there's also, if I say there's a first generation biomass, there's also a technical solution there, uh, and that is the second generation, as you may have guessed, of biomass, and that is just smarter processing. As I said, the way we currently do it, the Romans would recognize it, uh, but people are now working on a better conversion of the crop into the biofuel. We'll never really compete with fossil fuels because what you need to do is you have a 
field of maize, you need to harvest it. Then you need to separate the kernels from the rest of the plant. You need to dry all the material. Then you need to compact add the material and then you need to press it. And then you have your product, oh, well, almost, and then you need to refine it. And then you have your uh, bioethanol or your biodiesel. If you compare that to standard diesel, the separation, the compression, the drying and everything has been done by Mother Nature for you over millions of years. It's essentially the same, right? I mean, fossil fuels are just old plant material that has been compressed and converted into a gas or a liquid. If you do that with a crop of fresh material, you have to do everything yourself, right? All the conversions. So that will never really work. I mean, costs are coming down, but uh, there's not a lot of progress. Uh, but if there's a second generation, there's also a third uh, generation. And that is best illustrated with this picture. Um, <coughs> these are all the same plants, right? So this is the wild mustard. And through selective breeding, Wild mustard has been turned into cabbage, into Brussels sprouts, into kohlrabi, into kale, and broccoli, and cauliflower, and a few other uh, plants. And you see the enormous difference between the wild ancestor and the current crops, and between the crops themselves, right? Now, this was done by selective breeding, mostly by people who hadn't got a clue about genetics, right? and by trial and error, generation after generation after generation. Now we've done this with food crops. If you look at our energy crops, it's wood, right? <laughs> Just uh, actually what, what, what is happening in Drax at the moment in the English Midlands is that we're chopping up large amounts of forest in the American Southwest and in Canada, turn it into wood chips, ship it over the ocean and put it in what used to be a coal-fired power plant, right? That is how we get bioelectricity uh, in the United Kingdom. It's just wood, right? Wood as it has always been. Uh, if you look at um, rapeseed, it's actually another one uh, of the brassicas, right? It's roughly the same as it used to be. We haven't optimized our crops for energy production. At the moment, there is a lot of research going on of doing the same trick, but now with energy crops, not maximizing plants for the way they look, as we do with flowers, or how useful they are to feed us, but actually to make them more useful for fuel production, for energy. And we can expect a lot of progress there. There's been a lot of progress in the lab. <clears throat> Nothing has been commercialized yet. My favorite uh, is these algae that you put in a vat of warm water and you come back two weeks later and there's a film of diesel made by the algae and you just scoop it up and put it in your car and drive away. These things have not been scaled up, they've not been commercialized, but there's so much progress in the lab, give them 10 years and you can expect really, really rapid progress here. Because as I said, this was done through selective breeding by people who did not understand what they were doing. By now we understand genetics so very well that you can expect this process that took several hundred years, more like almost 2,000 years, I would say. We can expect to do this in a few decades now, right? <clears throat> so, lots of hope here. Some issues we are there, I mean, as I said, wind and solar, we are there, right? Biofuels, we're not quite there, but we are making very rapid progress. Okay, we're gonna break for 10 minutes. So, before the break, I talked about technical options for greenhouse gas emission reduction, mostly CO2 emission reduction. Uh, I can tell similar stories about methane and nitrous and all that stuff, but... Uh, that would just add to, well, would not add any insights. Um, now I'm going to talk about uh, the costs uh, of doing so. Um, I haven't timed this. Uh, I think I'm going to come to here, but we may uh, be able to do the distribution of costs uh, as well. 
Uh, this is where we are in the schedule. As I said, we're an hour ahead uh, of the schedule, which is good. Um, <clears throat> so let's talk uh, about some of the estimates of both the total and the marginal costs and why these are as they are. Uh, the first thing to note is that abatement costs are real and positive. I'll come back to this uh, probably next week. Um, there's two ways uh, of thinking about this. The sort of intuitive way is that if there were no climate policy, essentially you can put CO2 into the atmosphere for free. You don't pay a tax or a penalty on that. You don't need to buy a permit to do so. Um, and, or if the regulation is done through some technical constraints or technical standards, you're essentially allowed to put as much uh, into the atmosphere as you want, right? Essentially, you have, without climate policy, you have free waste disposal. With climate policy, you either have to pay, you have to pay for the CO2 you put into the atmosphere, or the government tells you you can't put as much as you would want to put into the atmosphere, right? So that must come at a cost. There's just no two ways around it. Uh, you can also look at this uh, through uh, a mathematical point of view. And if you see sort of the economy as agents who are minimizing their costs, who are maximizing their welfare or their utility, essentially what climate policy does is it puts a constraint on that maximization problem or that optimization problem. And whenever you impose a constra new constraint on an optimization, the costs go up, right? That follows immediately uh, from the work uh, by uh, Laplace. Um, Lagrange, sorry, not Laplace. Um, <clears throat> as long as the constraint bites, as long as it's meaningful, as long as emissions really go down below where they would have been, um, costs necessarily increase. Um, so that just uh, by way of introduction. The, the question is, of course, by how much? Um, and for that, I have this nice table that particularly the people in the back uh, really, really love. Um, the way to read the table is that these are marginal costs. This is the tax that we need to impose uh, in the near future. Uh, the rows have different uh, estimates, different models that estimate these things. And if you move from right to, no, from left to right, uh, climate policy becomes uh, more stringent. Now, this does not mean a whole lot to you uh, because you can't read the numbers and you don't know what they all mean. Uh, so let's look at a few graphs uh, instead. Um, this graph that you see here is this column. Um, and the first thing you noticed is this is the same policy, right? It's the same long-term climate target. It's the same implementation of the policy. Some models say that the cost is $1 per ton of carbon. Other models say it's 20. There's a factor of 20 difference between the different models. They just can't agree on why uh, this is, <coughs> how costly uh, this would be at the margin. And I'll come to the reasons for that uh, in a uh, few minutes. Well, that's an important thing to keep in mind, that we don't really have a good grip on how expensive this really would be. Um, the second thing, um, is that if we move, as I said, from left to right, climate policy becomes more stringent. And what you see in this particular graph is, lo and behold, if climate policy becomes more stringent, the costs go up, right? And not just a little. The numbers that you see here is the atmospheric concentration of CO2 at the end of the century. This is roughly, well, actually slightly above the Paris uh, targets, and this is more lenient climate policy, and this is more lenient climate policy still. And you see that the costs go up uh, quite rapidly. So that is an important thing to keep in mind, and that should be entirely intuitive, right? If you have more stringent policy, the cost is going to increase. Um, <clears throat> the other uh, bars uh, that you're looking at, so in blue, what we have is a so-called uh, um, 
So it's um, it's a first best implementation, and the aim is for the year 2100. Now what we saw in yesterday's exercise is we actually were talking about 2300 and there's two ways of defining that. Either you say, well, I'm interested in the temperature at the end of times, or the end of times in my model, right? It's hopefully not the end of times. Um, or I'm interested in the entire period. And what we saw yesterday is that if you are aiming for the temperature in 2300, we need to cut emissions by 2.5% per year. But if you're interested in keeping the temperature below 2 degrees for the entire three centuries of a model, we needed to cut emissions by 5% per year, right? Um, and that is also what you see uh, here. In blue, we're just interested in the year 2100. Uh, in red, we're interested in keeping the atmospheric concentration below the indicated level over the entire period. And what you see is that well, if it's a lenient target, it doesn't really matter. Uh, if it's a stringent target, costs at the margin double, right? Which you may have guessed from yesterday's exercise, right? 2.5% versus 5%, that's quite a big difference uh, in the rate at which you cut emissions. Um, the green bar uh, that you're looking at is um, same as the red bar, so we're just interest, we're interested in the entire period, not just the end of times, um, is who participates in climate policy. So in the blue and in the red, all countries are assumed to have a climate policy right from the start. In the green, we have the same target for the world as a whole, but rich countries only, uh, rich countries start right from the start, 2020 actually. Middle income countries, China, joins in 2030, and poor countries join in 2050 in climate policy. But we maintain the same global target, and the implication is that, well, you have fewer people to work on the same problem, so those fewer people have to work harder, right? And the costs, again, more than double. <clears throat> so these sort of design questions, what do you actually mean by your target? And a global target, but who is working on it? Really, really important for how costly this would be, right? for reasons that I think uh, are uh, intuitive. <clears throat> now, the question, why can't these guys, and they're really all guys except for this, there's a woman involved here, uh, but all the rest are guys, sorry. Um, yeah, <laughs> really. Uh, why can't they agree with one another? Uh, these are all the results uh, from uh, hmm, a long time ago. Uh, these are the latest results from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, same story, uh, more stringent climate policy requires a higher uh, carbon price. Um, carbon price goes up through uh, the years. This is carbon price in 2013, 2050, in the year 2100. Uh, this is lenient climate policy, this is very stringent climate policy. What you again see is that these models can't agree with one another, right? And note that this is a logarithmic scale, right? So if you take uh, this light blue policy, the carbon tax ranges from 90, the most optimistic model, to, what is it? 70,000? Is it 70,000? <clears> yeah, I think that's 70,000, uh, the most pessimistic model. Four orders of magnitude difference, right? No, three orders of magnitude dif difference. So why can't models agree on this is a question you might ask. <clears throat> now, this is true what happens at the margin. Um, 
It's also true in total. <clears throat> this is the same table as I showed before, but now we're looking at the total costs. And the numbers here are in trillion uh, dollars. And for those of you who can read this, um, who can't read this, uh, costs, I was talking about this policy, uh, very, well, let's just focus on this one, uh, very somewhere between 2 trillion, 2.2 trillion, or oh, 1.9 trillion, uh, up to 24 trillion. Again, an order of magnitude difference in the cost estimate. Now, you may think that 2 trillion is a lot of money. And it is definitely a lot of money compared to your bank account, right? It's also a lot of money even for Elon Musk, right? Uh, or uh, Vladimir Putin, and they, it's unclear who of the two is richer. Um, you may also think that 2 trillion is actually a lot of money compared to the world economy. The size of the world economy is around 80 trillion. And you may think, well, taking a bite of 2 trillion out of that, that is actually a fairly large sum of money. But that is not what this two trillion is about, right? This two trillion is the net present cost over the century. So if we let the economy grow at 3% per year, which it roughly does, discounted back at 5%, which is what is done here, the net present value of gross domestic product, gross world product, is 3,500 trillion. So two trillion or 24 trillion out of 3,500 trillion, it's actually a fairly small cost, right? It's large relative to your bank account, but it is small relative to the world economy over the appropriate period. <clears throat> and the reason for that, I explained before the break, right? We know how to solve this problem, and some of these new technologies, the carbon-free technologies, are more expensive, slightly more expensive than what we have at the moment, but not a whole lot more expensive. And if we take time and uh, introduce these things gradually, it could not cost the world, right? Well, something that uh, not a lot of people know is that if you look at the world economy, and you look at the cost shares in the different things that we use in our production, then the cost share of energy as a fuel, right? Not just the energy sector, but just the fuel, that's roughly 2% of the world economy on a cost basis. And if you take that 2%, mostly fossil fuels at the moment, and replace it with renewables that may be slightly more expensive, so perhaps on a cost basis, we go from 2% to 2.1%. That cannot cost a lot of money, right? It simply cannot, because energy is just not uh, important enough on a cost basis. Because this stri strikes you as strange at the moment, right? Because what we've seen is a very rapid rise in energy costs. Um, that is causing real economic harm. But that is because that is two things. A, it is a, an unexpected shock that is imposed on us, not a gradual introduction of climate policy. No, it is a shock. Putin invades Ukraine on the 24th of February, right? And on the 23rd of February, we weren't quite sure that he would do it, but on the 24th, he did. Um, so it's an immediate shock to the system. And the reason that it is so painful also for Europe is because we're transferring lots and lots and lots of money to an energy exporters. So for the world economy, it's actually a different story because there's also a lot of transfer going on. We pay more for our energy, which is very painful, uh, but the Saudis are laughing all the way to the bank because they get a lot more uh, money for their oil, right? And even the Russians uh, get more in their imports, uh, more on their exports uh, of oil than they used to, and gas. Um, and so, yeah, you should not be surprised that these numbers are small, is what I'm trying to say, right? Um, but um, people 
greatly differ. So those were all the results. These are newer results. Uh, this is the cost by the end of the century of stringent climate policy. We would be a few percent poorer in the year 2100 than we would have been without climate policy. Uh, I should actually point uh, <laughs> at this one. This is the end of the century. Um, but if we have a fairly lenient climate policy, then by the end of the century we would be 1% poorer than we otherwise would have been. And the, re the, the way to read this number really is the income that we would reach without climate policy on the 1st of January of the year 2100. With climate policy we would reach at the 1st of June or the 1st of July in the year 2100. That is how small this number is, right? But also there is great disagreement uh, between modelers as what, to the real, what is the real cost, right? There's one model that says even the most stringent climate policy can be achieved without cost. I think that's nonsense. Uh, and the most pessimistic model says, uh, no, it's going to cost us 10% of our income, which is five years of growth over 80 years, right? So the income that you would have reached in the year 2100, you will now reach in the year 2105. That's how to read these numbers. It's a small, right, for the reasons that I explained. But why do these modelers disagree, right? What is this uh, after 50 years of trying to solve this problem? And really, it has been 50 years, uh, 48 maybe. Um, why can't we agree on the number? Um, <clears throat> and the reason uh, is uh, explained here. Why do different experts, uh, let's be uh, gracious and call them that, uh, disagree on what it would cost to cut uh, emissions? Um, now, <coughs> First um, is what options are available to cut emissions. And if you believe that there is a whole range of technologies out there, then it's fairly cheap to cut uh, emissions. And if you believe that the technology space is constrained, that there's fewer options available, uh, then it is more expensive uh, to cut emissions. And this should be intuitive, right? Uh, before the break, I talked about nuclear power. If you believe that we can greatly expand uh, nuclear power, then it's relatively cheap to cut emissions. But if you think there are social and political uh, and environmental constraints on new power plants, new nuclear power plants, then it's much more expensive to reduce emissions. If 10 years ago you did not believe in electric vehicles because they were uh, just not good uh, for anything, then it would be expensive to decarbonize transport. But now uh, it's actually different. And we believe definitely for personal transport, electrification is an option, right? For heavy transport, we probably go to hydrogen rather than to electricity. Um, so that matters. And we're talking about future technologies, right? So it is actually reasonable people would reasonably disagree on what technologies would be, will be available in the future, right? <clears throat> um, the second and third reason uh, are uh, as uh, obvious, uh, I think. Um, if you believe that wind and solar are expensive the, relative to oil and gas, then it's expensive to reduce uh, emissions. And if you believe that wind and solar are cheap, then it's cheap to reduce emissions. Why do modelers disagree on the costs of current technology? A lot of these things are actually commercial secrets. As academics, we don't really observe the energy market that well. And uh, for instance, uh, what we see uh, in uh, the North Sea at the moment is that there's these concessions for developing offshore wind power are being auctioned. And what we see is the bids that people put in, 
and we see we observe the winning bid, we don't know whether that's the real cost of offshore. It may be that the company is actually able to do it cheaper, but thinks that their bid is competitive enough and therefore uh, they put in this price because that means that they can com command a higher price later. So it may actually just be, because uh, these concessions are local monopolies, right? It may just be rent seeking what they do. Or you can do it also interpret it the other way around that really what they're doing is they're bidding less than their real cost and then they win the concession and the implication is that somebody else cannot build there either because it's their concession. So there's actually no reason really to believe that the bids that you see go into these auctions are true and we actually don't really know what these things cost at the moment. Uh, but they obviously matter. Now, what we really don't know is how these things will develop over time, right? It's hard enough to know the true cost of wind and solar, let alone nuclear, right? Which is uh, a secret, very well kept by the French government and the Russian government and the Korean government, right? And they won't tell you the true cost of nuclear. Uh, forget it. Um, <clears throat> If you don't know the cost in 2022, let alone that we know the cost with any sort of degree of certainty in 2030 or in 2050 or in the year 2100. And obviously that matters, right? That obviously matters. And what matters of course here is not so much the absolute cost of wind and solar, but the cost of wind and solar relative to the cost of oil and coal and gas, right? That is what matters. Um, and again, reasonable people would reasonably disagree about how these trends would develop over the future. <clears throat> Models also disagree about this point, and this is a bit more subtle. Um, now, what we have observed, and I showed you a picture, is that the cost of wind and solar has fallen over time. And there's two ways of looking at this. You can see this, well, this just happens. Costs are falling over time and they will continue to fall into the future. Um, that's not really how things work, right? Because, I mean, photovoltaic panels don't get cheaper because time has progressed. No, they become cheaper because an engineer has done something clever, right? People have worked on these things to produce them more cheaply and to increase their efficiency. This is not manna from heaven. This is not because time progresses or because God has given us better technology. No, this is because clever people have worked on these things to make them better. So the costs are, and the changing cost is not exogenous, it's endogenous. And in some of these models, uh, the investment in R&D responds to climate policy. And in other models, it does not. In some models, that just happens, right? In other models, it responds to climate policy. <clears throat> and that would suggest that if you go in with climate policy, then people would see, well, there's a market for my emission-saving technology, so I'm going to put more R&D into this. And then the question is, of course, will this, the costs of renewable energy will then fall, right? And will fall more quickly than it would have been without climate policy, would have done without climate policy even. And that you may see as a gain, right? And then the costs of emission reduction fall. Climate policy becomes cheaper. But the question then is, what, 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 what is the opportunity cost of this? And let's stick uh, with uh, the automotive uh, industry. I mean, if you want to make cars more energy efficient, more fuel efficient, then what you need is people who understand how to improve engines, right? And you need more of those. And some of these models, the assumption is that there's an infinite supply of smart people. That if you need more automotive engineers, then you can just go pluck some guys out of their taxis uh, and girls as well and put them uh, into the car uh, 
factory car, car manufacturers and they will uh, build smarter engines. <coughs> I'm quite sure that that is true because it, I mean, the, the, the engines that we have are now about 150 years old and people have improved them a lot over those 150 years and the idea that you can pluck somebody from the street and they would make a useful contribution uh, to uh, fuel efficiency is a bit far-fetched. Um, what you could also have as a model in your head, well, it'll just pick up those people who are not automotive engineers, but who are genius in any field, and we pluck them from their laboratories, what they're currently doing, and have them work uh, on energy problems. And that would really help, and that may actually uh, work much better uh, than taking uh, underemployed taxi drivers off the street. Um, <clears throat> But there's an opportunity cost there as well, right? If you take the people who are currently working on solving cancer and instead have them work on improving energy efficiency, and yes, energy efficiency will improve faster, uh, but healthcare improvements in healthcare will decelerate, right? You can, you can sort of like see that different people, different modelers have very different ideas about how these things really work, what the true costs are, these are very hard to measure uh, and actually also very hard uh, to uh, model. Uh, I, I am of the school who says, well, if you're going to endogenize nice technological development, then probably you're going to increase the cost. As I said, fuel is about 2% of the world economy. So if you're going to take all the smart people in the world and focus have them focus on improving 2% of the world economy and neglect relatively the 98% of the economy, then chances are you're going to slow the economy down, right? Because you're going to focus all your effort onto the smaller part of the whole rather than the bigger part. <clears throat> um, so that is a, a, a fourth, fourth reason why people disagree on the cost. And the third and uh, fifth Come on, count. Uh, the fifth uh, reason uh, has to do with elasticities. Essentially, I mean, the prime uh, policy is to increase the price of fossil fuels. So what energy demand will then fall depending on your price elasticity. Substitution from fossil fuels to other uh, sources of energy depends on your substitution elasticity. And you, will, you may say, well, actually, in Acrometrics, we learned how to estimate elasticities. I hope that they taught you at one point how to estimate elasticities. So is this not a known problem? Is this not how can you possibly disagree uh, on this? Uh, measuring elasticities is actually difficult, A, and it's gone completely out of fashion. Uh, it's not something that you can publish in good journals with anymore. So all our estimates of elasticities are fairly old uh, and um, yeah, you would see a wide range of elasticities. Uh, similarly, <clears throat> uh, there's disagreement about how long capital really lasts. Uh, and this is actually an important uh, point and also explains uh, the next slide. Um, most of our energy use is set in stone. So the energy that you use depends on the physical characteristics of the house in which you live. And the energy use of the University of Sussex depends on our buildings. And you must have been in some of the older buildings where <laughs> the windows are just so crap, right? Uh, that you really wonder how will we get through the winter uh, in this room. So the only way to improve the energy efficiency is to go with structural measures, replace windows, replace walls, replace entire buildings, right? Similarly, uh, well, most of you probably take the bus or, or, or cycle uh, here, I, I drive. Um, my commuting distance is fixed and also the technology is fixed, right? Uh, it's a fairly old uh, Skoda Octavia uh, that determines how much fuel I burn uh, to get here. And that is basically fixed. That will change once I buy a new car, 
but it will not change uh, overnight. And even more, the place where I live and the place where I worked are even more fixed, right? I change my car more often than I change my house. Um, so the question then is, if you want to really want to reduce emissions, you need to affect the capital stock. How quickly can you do that? How, what is the lifetime of the average car? What is the lifetime of the average building? Again, you must say, well, these are must be known quantities, but they're not. And some of these things are actually much more stubborn than you would think they are. There's a few papers out there that uh, they may have talked about in economic history or in macroeconomics that essentially if you go to continental Europe, the roads are still where the Romans put the roads. And that means and the towns are still where the Romans put the towns. And that means that basic travel distances haven't changed in 2,000 years, right? That is what you need to change, right? And what, what is really the appropriate lifetime uh, of, our, of our habits and our capital stock? Those are actually, again, something where reasonable people could reasonably uh, disagree. <clears throat> And for all these reasons, you see that there is an order, sometimes two orders, occasionally three orders of magnitude difference between estimates of uh, the costs uh, of greenhouse gas emission reduction in these models. Now, what has happened over the last uh, couple of years is that people have also looked at this problem econometrically first climate policy was introduced in Poland uh, in 1991, shortly followed by Finland uh, in the same year. Uh, that is how old climate policy is, 31 years, older than most of you. Um, you may say, well, we've now estimated, I can, we can estimate econometrically what is the cost of greenhouse gas emission reduction. Unfortunately, those econometric uh, estimates are also all over the place. They also. <laughs> easily uh, differ an order of magnitude between them. So we just don't know what it costs uh, to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, <clears throat> we uh, can uh, talk about uh, a few uh, generic insights, uh, and I've given you uh, a few already, right? Uh, that it depends on who works uh, on the problem, and it depends on whether you want overshoot or not. Um, this is a second uh, important insight, and it's somewhat older, as you can see from the quality of the graphs. These were state-of-the-art graphs once, uh, but that's a while ago. Um, what you're looking at here is the atmospheric concentration of CO2 according to nine scenarios. Um, so ever more stringent uh, climate policy and then two ways uh, of getting there and it's hard to see the difference between the black and the light blue. Um, it's perhaps easier to look at not concentrations but to look at CO2 emissions. So uh, there's two ways of getting to 550, uh, that's this scenario here. You can follow the light blue and have an immediate deviation from the policy without climate policy, from the scenario without climate policy, uh, and then you uh, follow this line here. Or you could much more gradually deviate from the no policy scenario, and then of course, because you want to meet the same eventual target, then later on you need to work harder, <clears throat> right? Those are two basic options uh, that you have. Um, and then this graph here shows you the difference in costs. And if you want to know the difference in costs, you need to compare the first to the third or the second to the fourth. Um, <clears throat> the difference between the first and the second and the third and the fourth is again, do we have a global policy or do we have regional uh, policies? And you see that that matters too, but that uh, point I already made. Um, and what you see is that, yeah, you can halve costs if you follow the more gradual deviation versus the Big Bang in the beginning. Um, here it's a 10% cost uh, reduction, 
deal, we're talking about trillions of dollars, right? Um, here it's actually two-thirds uh, cost reduction. <clears throat> but all the models, as you see, agree that it's better to start slow and accelerate than to go in with a big bang and then relax later. And uh, the reason for this is fourfold. One is the capital stock turnover that I just talked about, right? A lot of our energy use, a lot of our CO2 emissions, therefore, is set in stone. And if you replace your car when it reaches the end of its useful lifetime anyway, it's not that expensive to buy a more fuel efficient car. But if you have to retire your car early, then it does matter. Gas fired power plants have a lifetime of 25 years. If you've just built a new one and now they come along and say, well, you need to, you should have built wind turbines instead, then you lose, after five years, say, then you lose 20 years of your investment. Coal fired power plants have a lifetime of 60 years or so. So if you want to prematurely retirement, that is retire them, that's capital destruction, right? It's cheap to replace these things at the end of their lifetime with something better because you're doing everything anyway, but premature retirement or refurbishment of capital uh, is expensive. Second reason is technological progress. Um, most assessments say, well, the price of renewables relative to the price of fossil fuels has been falling over time and will continue to fall over time. The relative price of renewables is coming down. And therefore, what is the best time of doing things? Later, because later it's cheaper, right? Third reason is the discount rate. We discount future costs, and I'll come back to that at nauseum uh, in week uh, nine. Uh, we discount the future. It also means that future costs matter less than today's cost, right? Um, again, an argument for postponing. And the fourth reason is a bit more subtle. Um, and that is um, the carbon cycle. So we've modeled the carbon cycle, so you now know how it works. So you put CO2 in the atmosphere, and then a year later, some of that CO2 has disappeared from the atmosphere because it's been absorbed by some physical or biological uh, some. Yeah, there's also some physical, some biological, or some chemical processes. Remove that CO2. <clears throat> and if you wait 10 years, more of it is gone. If you wait 100 years, uh, more of it is gone still. So if you're interested in what is going on in 100 or 300 years' time, if you cut your emissions in the year 2022, your emission reductions will also disappear, right? It's much more effective to cut emissions just before your uh, target year than to do it a century earlier. So all these reasons together conspire to say, well, we really should start gradual and accelerate rather than go in with a big bang. This is a message that is completely lost um, on our uh, dear leaders. Um, okay, I'm going to do uh, this bit. I think I can do it in five minutes. Uh, the feasibility of deep cuts. Uh, this table again, you did not read the numbers, but you did see oh, there's a lot of missing numbers, a lot of empty cells, right? Uh, and here we have this graphically. Um, so here are all the results that you see now uh, in, in a nice graph. And then here are the missing values. And the question is, why are there so many missing values, right? And what you also see is that this is actually not a random pattern that in the more lenient uh, climate policy, all the models reported results and the more stringent climate policy get fewer and fewer models report uh, results. Um, and that has to do with this thing. And it's actually also, um, what you saw in the exercises we did uh, this week. Um, this is if you want to keep the temperature at one and a half degrees, as uh, the Paris Agreement says we should, 
what should happen to global emissions. <clears throat> and we're looking at alternative scenarios here. Um, okay, here it comes again. Uh, this is if we can't suck CO2 out of the atmosphere. And here we're sucking more and more CO2 out of the, in the atmosphere. And you see uh, the difference in uh, scenarios, right? If we can suck CO2 out of the atmosphere later, we don't have to work quite so hard now. But if you look at this is what happened to emissions in the past, right? This is what should happen to emissions in the future. There's a complete reversal of trends, right? Is that feasible? Is that doable? Um, <clears throat> And it used to be that people thought, nah, <laughs> forget it. My model can't do it. Although there's also some instances here where people said, well, my model can do it. But their carbon price would so, be so high that I would assume that people would revolt uh, against this. So I think there's political constraints uh, that it won't happen. Uh, and other people said, well, <laughs> Uh, my model can do it, but I'm not going to make a fool of myself and report these results, right? Uh, so there's all sorts of reasons why people did not report this. And there's also some models that just could not get there. The reason that uh, people can get there nowadays is because of developments in the models more than developments in um, the technology uh, itself. <clears throat> So what do you do if you burn fossil fuel? You take ancient biomass, you put it on fire, uh, you oxidize it and you emit CO2. Right? That is the heart of the problem. What you can do, I haven't talked about this, uh, but it's actually technically feasible that instead of venting the CO2 into the atmosphere, you capture it from your smokestack and you put it someplace safe, deep on the ground, deep uh, on the water. That is technically feasible. We know how to get CO2 out of the atmosphere, right? That is the bubbles in your beer. That is CO2. We know how to capture CO2. Technically, no problem. Um, so this is one way of reducing emissions that I haven't talked about. Um, <clears throat> this is something that I did talk about. If you grow trees, they suck CO2 out of the atmosphere. If you then chop the tree down and put it in uh, an oven and uh, burn it, you can make electricity. And that is CO2 neutral, right? Because the CO2 that tree takes up is then re-emitted if you burn the tree. But of course, if instead of venting the CO2 in the atmosphere, you capture it and store it, you have negative carbon energy, right? You make energy while sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere, and then instead of putting it back in, you stick it in a geological storage. <clears throat> Technically, this works. Um, and that is the negative emissions uh, that you see here. This is bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. <clears throat> Technically, no problem. The assumption here is that we can just do it. Um, if you look at what these models actually need to do, uh, and I need to go through this fairly quickly. Uh, these points are um, irrelevant, just focus on this graph and on this graph. Here indeed we see global CO2 emissions in the dark green. And what you see is just as in the uh, thing that I showed before, emissions actually go negative. Now if your climate policy is a carbon tax, that is people have to pay if they want to emit, and if emissions go negative, the carbon tax turns into a carbon subsidy, right? I mean, people are not sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere because they like it, and the market for CO2 is saturated. It's not that you're going to put more bubbles in your beer, right? That is not how you're going to get rid of the CO2. No, the only reason to do it is because you get a subsidy. Um, these are the carbon prices that are uh, consistent with that. This is the total carbon subsidy that would be, or the, this is the, the fiscal position. Uh, so this is the carbon tax revenue, which goes to 2, 3% of GDP. Not a big problem. But then the 
subsidy that will be given by the end of the century goes to 4% of GDP. And if you take uh, this model here, it goes to 16% of GDP. <coughs> Ow. Right? Um, so the current global tax take is 15% of GDP. And if you want to give a subsidy of 15% of GDP, then all your tax revenue goes to that subsidy, right? Um, even if it's 4% of GDP only, this is roughly how much we spend on education, right? And this is what you need to be spending on sucking all that CO2 out of the atmosphere. Now, spending a lot of money on defense or on healthcare or on education is something that you can convince the electorate, well, this is a good spending of your, good spend of your tax money. Sucking that CO2 out of the atmosphere, that is not money that will be paid to the friendly teacher of your kids or uh, the nurse uh, who helped you in A&E, right? That's not where the money will go. This money will go, the only way to suck a lot of CO2 out of the atmosphere for biomass is large-scale monoplantations by large multinationals in faraway places, right? And the idea that we would be giving a 4% subsidy every year to these companies, probably not the political platform you want to stand on, right? Um, so, technically, yeah, can be done. Is it feasible? I am not convinced. Um, I am three minutes over time. Next week, we're going to pick up the discussion. We're going to talk for an hour about the distribution of costs. We're going to talk about negative costs. Uh, and then we're going to talk about policy instruments.